On episode 238 of the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast, we meet with Dr. and Mrs. Pitcarn and discuss their book, Dr. Pitcarn's Complete Guide to Natural Health for Dogs and Cats. You can find the full show notes for this episode at 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash 238. Have you decided you're ready to make a change? To reclaim your health and fitness, the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast is here for you. I'm your host, Alan Meisner. I'm an NSAM certified personal trainer with a specialization in corrective exercise and fitness nutrition. Let me be your coach as you find your way on your health and fitness journey. All right, let's go. Would you do one thing for me right now? Whatever you're listening to this podcast on, if you would go ahead and give us a rating and review and make sure that you subscribe to the podcast, I'd really appreciate it. Uh, When we get ratings and reviews, what it allows me to do is to know what I'm doing well and what I can improve on. Plus, it tells the powers that be that this is an interesting podcast and that other people should know about it. So it helps us get found a little bit if you'll do those three things. Rate, review, and subscribe. Thank you. So you might be asking yourself, okay, this is a health and fitness show for 40 plus year olds. Why are we talking about dogs and cats? Well, there are little fur babies and those people, the people that own pets tend to live longer. So if you don't have a pet, probably something you should consider. And if you do have a pet, right now you're working on taking care of yourself, you can and should be doing the same for them. Dr. Pitcarn and his wife have been in uh, veterinary medicine forever, I mean literally forever. They wrote the first edition of this book back in 1981, and this is the fourth edition. So they've made some revisions. They even have some recipes in this book so you can feed your animals properly and understand all the things that you need to take care of your pets. And we get into that in pretty good detail in this episode. So with no further ado, I introduce you to Dr. and Mrs. Pitcarn. So Dr. and Mrs. Pitcarn, welcome to 40 Plus Fitness. Thank you, Ellen. Thanks. We're, it's our pleasure. So, you know, I saw your book, and interestingly enough, it, it, it did actually come up in a health and fitness uh, search for me. And I was like, okay, you know, I know and I've seen the research that having pets are going to help you live longer. Pet owners live longer than folks that don't, just as people who are married tend to live longer than individuals who are single. So I thought, you know, this is actually appropriate. And in many cases, the more I read the book, the more I was like, okay, this you could have written this book about humans and it wouldn't have been far off the mark. Mm-hmm. That's no, true. that's yeah. true, yeah. And a lot of people through the years have uh, applied some of the advice that we've given in our previous editions of the book to themselves. Well, the recipes that were in the book, I I, I would eat them. And I think that that was actually probably part of the point was that, you know, we feed ourselves in many cases. We, we, we are now trying to take better care of ourselves in our 40s, 50s, and 60s and older. And so we're starting to eat better because we recognize what that's doing for us. But we don't always kind of lend that same benefit to our pets. And uh, this book kind of goes a long way towards saying, you know, the foods that we would feed ourselves or, or you know, if, we, if they're prepared properly are good for our pets. Yeah. And I, I found over the years, uh, this, of course, is a, we're talking about the fourth edition. And I found in my practice over the years that with earlier editions of the book that people would sometimes start to prepare the food for their animals at home. And that would change their lifestyle. They started preparing it for themselves as well. So it actually worked the other direction. Yeah, because you're shopping for better food, and now you actually have the food in your refrigerator or in your house. And so it's just as easy for you to shop once and you know cook for the all of you. That's right. And we've taken it, that idea even a step further in our fourth edition, the one that's coming out in March uh, 21st. And we've got a whole new series of recipes called Pets Plus People. So there, what it is, is a high-protein food that you can feed your animal and that you can feed, use as an entree for yourself. And in most cases, they're actually whole food plant-based uh, or they're vegan recipes. And we can talk also about why we are going that direction, which I know some people will probably object to. <laughs> But, but we're getting a lot of enthusiasm, too, for that. It really was a twist, I'll admit. So you, you've got a plot there, and I'm like, okay, I, I have to read more. And it really starts with understanding the food chain, because I think that drives a lot of the reason why you believe that somewhat of a vegetarian or vegan style of eating for pets, and I guess even for humans, is really a better approach. So could you kind of walk us through the food chain so we can understand where your where your premise is coming from. Are you thinking that when you talk about food chain, you mean in terms of 
the health effects of environmental. Well, yeah, I mean, what you have, you know, in the in the book, you kind of talked about, okay, so there's plants, and then you know, the animal will eat the plants that have some toxins in them, and they accumulate those toxins over time, and then of course the bigger animals, the predators, will then eat the smaller animals, and so on and so on. So there's an accumulation of these toxins over time that you find in in some of the larger, uh, more fatty animals. Yes, yes, exactly. And, yeah. and in fact, excuse me, all, all 85 to 98 percent of, of environmental toxins that we consume come in through the form of eating animal fat. So that's like, that was kind of a surprise to us. That really has a major impact on pets. And, and I could see that, yeah. If, if a large portion of their food was, you know, because, and I think a lot of people, they think, um, rightfully so to some extent, in, in the wild or in, in a normal situation, your, your dog or cat would eat meat. And in many cases, you know, particularly with the cats, as I learned from the book, need some of the nutrients that they get from meat. And so you would expect, okay, that's what they're going to do. They're going to run down a field mouse. They're going to run down a rabbit. But your your standard dog, unless, again, they were part of a pack of wolves, isn't going to take down a larger ruminant animal uh, like a cow or, you know, something even bigger. But so they're t- I would think they would be eating smaller smaller animals that were less of predators than anything else. But, yeah, I mean, I guess if there's an accumulation of those, then now now here's your – animal because you're feeding them those things accumulating those same toxins well Ellen the thing that let's go back to that for a moment that's it's this is an important thing for people to understand because when we talk about the toxins that are that are in animal flesh sometimes people say well there's also stuff in plants you know they want to avoid the plants because they think of herbicides and pesticides what you have to understand is there's what's called bioaccumulation and what that means is that each step up the food chain, and I mean up the food chain, meaning starting with simple organisms and then plants and then the animals that eat the plants and the animals that eat the animals and so on up the chain. Every step, the chemicals that are acquired from the environment are concentrated many thousands and thousands of times. Uh, like, for example, it's been shown in reference to PCB chemicals, which are one of the most common contaminants found in, in the streams, you know, water streams of our lakes and rivers of our country, that a trout swimming in that water concentrates that chemical 10,000 times in its tissues, just to give you an idea. So the ones that are going to be getting the most chemicals, the most concentration, are at the top of the food chain. And in our country, the ones at the top of the food chain are human beings, dogs, and cats. And so they're going to have the highest, not only the number of chemicals, but the highest amounts of chemicals. Does that make sense? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. So that's really important to remember because it's not just a question of exposure, though that's important. It's also how much is actually accumulating in the tissues to where it has a biological effect. We also found that, you know, there's been different studies through the years. And, and for example, um, even just, you know, some years ago, vegetarian women were found to have only 1% to 2% of the levels of pesticides in their breast milk as the average American woman and that tells you, I mean, there haven't been a lot of tests on dogs and cats. There have been some, but that's a huge difference. And also, Alan, I can, I can add to that, uh, just to bring this into more context, is the reason we're emphasizing it, I'm speaking for myself here from my experience in practice, that I think a lot of the chronic health problems we're facing now in dogs and cats is due to this accumulation. We're seeing new conditions, new uh, diagnoses, you know, a kind of a confusing array of problems that don't really fit any particular pattern, like they're not infections necessarily. They're not necessarily just immune diseases, but there's something else. And I think what it is is that these chemicals are affecting their health, and we've overlooked that fact. We've not paid attention to how much of it there is, especially the last 20 to 30 years. Yeah, and, and I can see where that would that would be complicated to assess because someone's bringing in their dog or their cat and you know it's got that rough patch and you know like you said in the book you you know you they've tried the cortisone shots they've you know they've tried everything to try to help this this animal but it's just it's just miserable and so now we're saying let's focus on what we're what we're feeding our animals and make sure that now at least we're giving them the nutrition that's not causing more of the problems with the toxins and, and other issues. Yes, and, and another way to put that is that just generalizing or simplifying the way it is in practice, a veterinarian generally will use drugs like antibiotics against infections or they use uh, steroids, cortisone, prednisone, that kind of thing to stop inflammation from the, the immune system acting excessively. 
But what if you have a problem that doesn't fit either of those categories? You see, what if it's just a toxic effect? Then the drugs don't do anything to the animal to, to help it. You understand? Yeah. And, and in fact, actually might make it worse. Might make it worse because now they have no defenses against dealing with it at all. And it's not something that most veterinarians uh, really even think of, or, nor doctors. But we're finding that uh, animals are, are having far higher rates of chronic disease and cancer and things like that than, uh, for example, when Richard was first in practice in the 1960s. It's really increasing. You know, like a million, as many as half of dogs are expected to die of cancer, and he hardly saw that. I know, I know this. I'll be cooking, and I'll drop a piece of broccoli on the ground, and the closest dog is going to just snatch it up and eat it and probably not even taste it. But it was food. It hit the ground. They heard us say, uh-oh, and they're on it. You know, that's, that's the signal, the, the signal that food hit the ground and the, they're on it. But I'm not going to be able to sit down and, and, and set a plate of broccoli out for JoJo or, <laughs> or Angel and say, okay, you know, here's your dinner. There's some prep. There's some things we have to do to make sure that they're getting the proper nutrition, the proteins, and in many cases, the fats and whatnot for the cats particularly. So can you kind of walk us through just, you know, at, at a high level, what are some of the nutritional considerations if we decide that maybe going vegan to help our animals uh, live longer and healthier if that's the route we want to go, what are some considerations that we would want to have in place to make sure that uh, we're doing the right thing? I spent hundreds of hours analyzing different uh, recipes and combinations of food to make sure that they would meet the standards that are recognized for dogs and cats, both recipes with and without meat. And uh, this time in our book, we were able to do that in much more detail than we've been able to do in the past because there's these wonderful online nutritional calculators. So in that process, we I looked at the, um, like I said, the AFCO, American Association of Feed Control Officials, guidelines, and then made sure that we met or exceeded them. And I like to do things kind of thoroughly in that way, uh, and that's and we don't want to make sure we have all our bases covered. And so these recipes are, are amply supplied with protein and minerals and, and vitamins and so forth as needed. And they do, especially for cats, you absolutely have to use, to, to do a vegan recipe at home for a cat, you absolutely have to use a veggie cat supplement that we recommend because there's certain things you just kind of can't get out of, of plant-based foods that they need. Dogs, you can kind of get away with just feeding them what you eat. A lot of people seem to if they have a high level, relatively speaking, of legumes. You know, So like if you have as much as maybe 50%, 60% of, of what you feed them is, is like garbanzos, lentils, tofu, things like that. You know, we have heard many cases of, of dogs that have thrived and, and some that have even lived as long as 20 or 25 years on such diets. So we have, a, for example, a lentil stew that's uh, based on a, a program that a woman in England fed her tribe of dogs <laughs> who lived uh, as long as 20 and 25. And it's, it's basically lentils, brown rice, nutritional yeast, uh, some soy or tofu, a little bit added up the protein. And uh, the, on the, the yeast supplies B12. Well, we have a similar recipe, uh, only we add we use a veggie dog supplement that supplies B12 and also up certain amino acids like methionine and so forth that are needed more for fur-bearing animals than, than for humans, just to make sure. But but we have been amazed to see the number of examples of of really healthy animals on these diets. I mean, so for example, a friend of ours, Dr. Alan Schoen, was telling us that he once saw a dog, a healthy, bouncing, you know, kind of mixed breed, middle-sized dog come in at age 21 for its first office visit. And it was in great shape. They did the thorough exam, did the lab work and, and all that on it. And it was it was really doing well. And so he asked, you know, what was she feeding it? And she'd been feeding it a fresh, homemade, vegan diet, much like she'd been eating with healthy oils and fats and things and uh, plenty of protein. And And this dog was just thriving. So we have to ask the question, why? Why would that be? You know, and it, is it because there's fewer toxins? That could be a big part of it. I mean, of course, it's natural for dogs to eat meat. And, and, and some people have come to believe that that's kind of all that they can and should eat these days. But historically, we also found in our research that back in ancient Greece and Rome and those kinds of times, what they recommended to feed the dog <laughs> was something like bread and whey, you know, or barley and beans, you know, and maybe the leavings of the stew pot. So there might have been a little flavoring, a little bit of meat, but they weren't going to waste their meat, which was precious, on their animal. So to take advantage of, of all the, um, the starches, like uh, the grains and so forth that were in, in 
starchy tubers that were being grown by human beings at the dawn of agriculture, the early ancestors of dogs adapted. It's been found recently, you know, in a study of the dog genome, that many of uh, they produce many more times of the, the genes that are needed to make amylase, which digests starches, uh, some 28 times more than wolves have. So when people think that, that uh, dogs and cats cannot digest uh, carbohydrates or grains, that's, that's completely inaccurate. I mean, it's been found otherwise. Well, I guess given the, the shorter the shorter lifespans and the, and the shorter breeding periods for dogs and cats, they would go through many more generations in the time that we have domesticated them and been hanging out with them. So, you know, some of the things that they should have had more time to generally adapt to a lot of the things that humans would bring to the mix of, you know, serving them what we would call, I guess, for lack of a better term, human food. Yeah, that's a good point. So, okay. So now we've decided, okay, we want to take better care of our dogs and cats, and we're going to start moving them over and transition them over to a, a better diet with cleaner and better foods. And you got tons of recipes in the book to kind of help us along the way with that, along with uh, some information on the supplementation that might be necessary and is absolutely necessary for cats. But now our dog is, is and cats are still being exposed to environmental toxins themselves, not just from the food, but other ways. So what are, you have some do's and don'ts in the book to kind of also make sure that we're protecting our pets from those types of things. Do you mind taking a little bit of time to discuss that? Sure. I think maybe a way to understand it, at least for me, for my mind, because I, you know, over the years, I asked myself the same question, what can we do with uh, exposure to the things that are in the home or on the streets and so on? And I think it helps to understand, it helped me to understand that one of the problems is, is the nature of the material that we're talking about. That is that the, over the last decades, our culture has adopted the practice of developing substances, chemicals, synthetic chemicals, right, that are living through chemistry. And these substances that were developed are new things on our on our planet, basically. They've never existed here before. And the outcome of that, the significance of that, is that when they are taken into the body one way or the other, through swallowing or breathing or through the skin, oftentimes our bodies don't know what to do with the substances. They've never seen them before, so to speak, and they not develop a method of neutralizing it or getting rid of it. And at first, it sounds kind of simple. Well, you know, you can just, the body can just throw it off, but it's not really like quite that simple. It's like there's a mechanism of detoxification, and it involves several steps involving use of the liver, you know, addressing that substance, maybe attaching it to something or breaking it down, sending it to the kidneys or the bowels or whatever. And a lot of these substances now we're dealing with, the body just doesn't know what to do with it, basically, putting it in simple terms. So it just stores it in the fat. It's just so like you and I would do if somebody brought some stuff to us. We didn't know what to do with it. We couldn't throw it away. It wasn't allowed. We'd probably stick it in our closets, you know. So what's happening now is that a lot of stuff that we're encountering, we and the animals are encountering, are substances like that, that the body just can't deal with very easily. So that being said, I would say the logical thing to me is to avoid using them, which means in our book we emphasized rather than use a lot of these chemicals sold over the counter for cleaning or for treating your yard or whatever, turn to more natural methods, more natural substances, so we because have they can be processed. They can be broken down by the body if necessary. So in Chapter 10, Creating a Healthy Home, we go into a lot of detail on that. And I think one of the things that's also important to realize is that a lot of pollutants are carried in dust cells where? Onto mm -hmm. the ground. Mm -hmm. And who walks barefoot on the ground and then licks themselves? Mm -hmm. not, so, not usually people. <laughs> Although I, I've actually seen someone do that. It was a Big Brother show no, in the yeah. UK. <laughs> and... Walk, yeah, <laughs> licking their feet. <laughs> Very <laughs> flexible people. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, so that's, you know, so our dogs and cats are picking up a lot of that. Plus, they're just, you know, shorter, they're lower to the ground, and they're going to be getting, you know, all these things. So grooming is important, you know, to, to brush them and, and help get that out. And then just, as well as just a lot of different things about, you know, it, like you said, like eliminating the use of these chemicals. The book has quite a few do's and don'ts. So it's, a, you know, this is worth having as a reference book. And the interesting thing is I kind of went through it is, well, we live there too. <laughs> so, you know, if you're not going to do it for your pet, do it for yourself. Yeah, there's a movie called Chimerical, which uh, is really interesting. It shows that we're a family for something like six weeks avoids using a lot of the common household products they've been using and, and they're tested before and after and their blood levels really go down 
and uh, one of the sons has, has, I believe, asthma, and it goes pretty much goes away during that process. So it makes a, a lot of difference. Could I say something else also back to the vegan diet thing before we leave, leave that topic? One of the major motivations, besides the, the low toxic part, well, two of them really, are also the ecological and humane benefits. And the ecological benefits are really what got us to change our diet a few years ago. After we saw the film Cowspiracy, and we, we learned what an urgent uh, condition our Earth is in. So, like, you know, health, personal health or the health of your pets doesn't really matter if we're running out of water, if we're running out of soil, if the uh, lungs of the Earth, you know, the Amazon forests and the oceans are not able to produce oxygen, and if we run out of fish in the sea, all these things are predicted to happen, you know, within the next few decades or by the end of the century. We detail that uh, a lot in, our, in Chapter 4 in our book. And so the essential thing to know about that, the difference between the two diets, between a plant-based diet and an omnivore, or even more so a raw meat diet, is huge. So like, it takes like something like 18 times the amount of, of land and, and, 15, and 12, you know, 10 to 20 times all the different resources, soil, I mean, excuse me, water and uh, fossil fuels and, and all these different things and, and also greenhouse gas contributions between the two, our, our diets are huge. And so our interest is in seeing that we have a sustainable and livable planet. That's in question right now. It really is. You know, if you start looking at the facts, and it's not something that a lot of people are comfortable doing. But when you look at the impact, and we did, for something like, say, a 70-pound golden retriever that's eating a raw food diet, like a lot of holistic veterinarians are recommending, the impact, like I've calculated this, seems to be about twice that of the footprint of a human being, and according to the you know the, the film Cowspiracy, that would amount to something like uh, each day a dog eating that kind of a diet versus eating a plant-based diet would be costing the world about 90 pounds or so of grain that could be fed to the 1 billion starving humans that can't afford to buy it because it's fed to livestock, about 60 square feet of rainforest, and maybe some 40 pounds of carbon dioxide equivalent, enough fossil fuel to drive uh, something like over 90 miles, and a couple of animals' lives. So it's these are, are significant differences. And then when you consider, I know a lot of people try to do it quote, the right way. They get the meat you know, from hunting or from their local farmer or whatever. But the fact remains that some, you know, the vast majority of the small species, like chickens and turkeys and, and rabbits and, and so forth, as also pigs, are factory farmed in conditions that you wouldn't wish upon your your worst enemy. And most cattle, ultimately, even though they're grass-fed, are are feedlot raised, too. And the slaughtering process is brutal for all of them. And so our appeal is that if you love animals, and that's why people like to have this connection with companion animals, then how can you not love and care for all animals? So that's that's something that we think that it's just an appropriate thing to do for each person to look into their conscience you know, do we care for all animals? Do we care for our own children or grandchildren for future generations? And as we looked at it, we think that the issues are getting so urgent that it's time to do something that even though it seems kind of counterintuitive, you know, <laughs> to feed plant-based diets to dogs and cats, it makes sense. So I want to get on to two other, I would call them, I guess, somewhat controversial topics. One is safe and effective flea control. And you're right. You know, you, get, you buy that stuff uh, from the vet that you apply, I think, once every three to six months. And it basically tells you not to get this on your skin, but that's exactly where you're, you're applying it on your pet. Inherently, you know that this isn't something you should be doing, but you, you know, you have to manage the fleas. So what is your natural approach to dealing with fleas that's uh, effective and, and as effective as, as what we're, what we're currently doing? First, Alan, uh, just tell you a little story about that, that I found really inter- informative. This goes back quite a few years when these products first came out, you know, maybe, I don't know, what, 20 years ago or something like that. And so I read, as you said, the instructions about applying these substances to the skin of the dog. Or I guess it was dogs then rather than cats. So I don't think they had a cat one yet. And it said to wear gloves and avoid skin contact, as you said. So I called the company, that particular product. I don't remember what the name was now, but, and I asked them about it. I said, well, if you put this on your dog and it spreads over its entire body, and it says in the, in the leaflet that it doesn't come off as washing, what happens when your child hugs a dog? Isn't it going to get on your child and spread over its entire body? 
And this person said, well, we don't know about that. We didn't have to look at that. I said, well, what could it cause any health problems in the child? And they said, well, we don't have to test for that, only for, you know, sex on dogs. And I thought, oh, my gosh, you know, it's like, what are we doing here putting this stuff out like that? It's not logical. So anyway, it's just a little background. I thought that was very informative, you know, to realize that companies didn't really look into the, the effects on other on human beings and other forms of life, just what it did to the dog. So to answer your question, as we describe in the book, there are many ways to deal with it. The, using the chemicals to a dip or a spray can be rather dramatic, and you see a lot of dead fleas. But as we are implying, it isn't necessarily very healthy for the animal because it's toxic. I mean, these things, these substances are poisons. That's why it kills the insect. And a lot of these poisons that are used, whether it be used on plants or insects or whatever, worms, these poisons are not, I'm generalizing, but they are not usually substances that have no effect on other forms of life. It's just that they don't have as much effect as what they say. In other words, a flea chemical may kill the flea and it doesn't (laughs) kill your dog or cat, but it may have some effects still on them. It depends on the amount and exposure and so on. So if you want to avoid that, which we recommend, then you have to look at a different approach. One thing that's really helpful to understand about fleas is that they are what are called nesting parasites in biology. And what that means is the fleas, about 90% of the fleas will be off the animal developing somewhere. So the ones you see in your dog or cat are just a small proportion of them. The ones that are developing are generally where they nest in nature, they're nesting places your, you know, their their holes or sleeping areas. In your home, it'll be usually where they sleep or where they hang out, outside or inside. So you want to give a lot of attention to those areas especially. And by attention, I mean vacuuming. Maybe if it's not a carpet, you know, you can use hot water, even hot water alone, but hot water with soap to mop a floor is really helpful because the heat will kill the, the flea larva. The baby fleas, which are the larvae, they can't really go anywhere. They can't, they don't have any legs. So they just hang out like little worms, kind of, wherever the eggs have been laid or dropped off. So they can't get away from that. If you know, if you have an area with your, your dog sleeps a lot in the kitchen floor or something, give a lot of attention to that, mopping it with hot water every, you know, maybe every once a week or a couple of times a week or something. And that will pretty much destroy the developing fleas. The other thing you can do is... Um, which can be real helpful, I find, in uh, some persistent problems, especially if you have more than one animal, is to get some flea traps and put them in the home because what they are is um, usually you plug them in and they provide warmth that, that attract the, the developing fleas to jump over and get on them, and they usually have some kind of sticky substance on them or a, or a, a liquid that drown the fleas. You can treat the animal directly with things like flea combs and bathing and so on, uh, herbal repellents and uh, measures like that. So really what we're talking about, just kind of in summary, is we're talking about sanitation. We're talking about keeping the environment as clean as possible and keeping your animals as clean as possible that way. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It takes more work. It's not as simple as just spraying <laughs> something on them. Yeah, you know? well, uh, you know, the, having um, fur babies is, is a responsibility. And, you know, you just you have to take that on and keeping them healthy and living a good good life, I think, you know, it's just, it's going to take some effort. And, uh, you know, that's, these are not, the things you're talking about are not game changers. I mean, it's, uh, you know, a few hours here, a few hours there occasionally to make sure that you're, you know, managing the hygiene of your pet and its environment, I think is, um, is excellent. Yeah. And I think, I think another thing that kind of helps people sometimes to see is that, uh, because I'll have that objection said to me sometimes, well, well, that's too much work. You know, I don't have time for that. And I'll say, well, what if you use the chemical? In this instance, we're talking about chemicals. Let's say you use them regularly and your animal gets sick. Do you have time to take it to the veterinarian and earn the money to pay for all that treatment? So you got to put the whole thing together. You see what I mean? Well, and it's, it's, it's interesting that you would bring up the money because when your pet's not well, you are spending a good bit of money on your pet. But and it's crazy with, with three, you know, it's almost, it seems like every other month we're getting a letter from our veterinarian. We've, we've recently changed. So I'm, I'm hoping that changes as well, but we get a letter. It, it's time for them to come in and get their shots. And so I just, it feels like we're vaccinating our pets, at least at my home all the time. And I know it's a cycle of once a year, but in the book, you kind of say that that might be a little too much. And there really are only a few things that you really need to be considering as far as vaccinations for your pets. Do you mind going into that? Sure. Uh, It's a topic we could spend a lot of time on. I will say, first of all, you see if this um, 
helps to answer that. It's known that, generally speaking, for human beings and for animals, that when you have vaccines, especially vaccines against viruses as opposed to bacteria, but it's true somewhat for bacteria, but viruses like the stemper and and um, parvovirus virus and so on, that unless there's something wrong with the animal, if they receive a vaccine, uh, they're not too young. Let me bring a little context. They're not, you know, they're not immature. It's not given too young to them. And they're not sick with some problem, but it's given to a healthy animal. That animal will become immune for life. That's pretty well understood in immunology. In other words, there's no indication and no research or science behind the idea of vaccinating every year. That was something that was adopted by the profession without any scientific basis. It's not necessary, and it even can be harmful because the vaccines are often given in combination. They cause sometimes confusion of the immune system, cause allergies to develop, other kinds of immune problems. And we discuss that quite a bit in the chapter in the book about the problem with vaccines and why it's not good to, to use them that often. So to come back to your question, I'd say, yes, they're being used way too much. They're not necessary. And they could even be harmful. Now, with rabies in, in most states, I think there's a requirement that you do at least get a rabies shot. How frequently would that be required, do you think? Well, it varies with different states. A lot of states say every three years. But, you know, Alan, it's helpful to understand that that requirement is not one that's set up by the veterinary profession. It's set up by the human medical profession, if I can call it that, to protect people. It's a requirement that's placed on the veterinary profession that they do that. There's nearly no evidence that the immunity wears off in three years. But again, the research, there is some of that research being done now. I know that there are some people that have organized and are, are actually doing studies now in dogs to see how long their immunity lasts. So maybe we'll be able to have more scientific basis for, for changing that. But again, this was just established as a way to protect people. Basically. Okay. So in general, if my dogs have, have ever been, they were old enough at the time and they had the parvo and the distemper shots, they should be good to go. And uh, rabies, something to look at every, you know, about every three years on par. Just the money you're going to save on these extra vaccinations that your dog doesn't need is going to more than pay for the book. So, <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> Good point, good point. <laughs> so, you know, this is a great reference to have. I'm, I'm very happy to now have it on my bookshelf. We're going to be incorporating a good bit of what we've learned from this book uh, with our pets. Um, we've got Jojo, Angel, and Baby. And so their, their lifestyle is going to change a little bit on the basis of what I learned from your book. So thank you so much for sharing this with us. You know, what would be interesting, Alan, sometime, um, say maybe six months from now, is for us to talk again about how it went with your animals. I will definitely reach out and let you know how it goes. Yeah. Okay. Now, if someone wanted to get in touch with you or learn more about the book, where would you like for me to send them? Oh, gosh. Well, it could... Moment of fear just <laughs> went through, through me. <laughs> well, the book is on Amazon, so I can make sure that I link to that. Also, I wanted to let you know that I have a YouTube channel, and on it, there's an, about an hour-long presentation on the new diets, uh, the update in our book. And uh, that, you know, if you go, you just, if you just search uh, vegan diet, Susan Pitcairn, for do vegan diets, dogs and cats. Okay. I will make sure uh, that in the show notes, we have links to both the book and uh, that YouTube channel. And this is going to be episode 238. So you can go to 40plusfitnesspodcast.com forward slash 238 and find the links to the book and that YouTube channel. So uh, Richard and Susan, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate you sharing this. Having a pet in your life is going to add more joy and add more longevity. And so taking care of our pets is an important part of taking care of ourselves. So thank you so much for sharing with us today. Day. Helen, it was fun. I hope you took something quite valuable out of today's lesson. Uh, even though it's about our pets, we should be doing just as much to take care of their health and fitness as we do for our own. And if you did enjoy it, please do take a second, go give us a rating review and subscribe to the podcast. Next time on the 40 Plus Fitness Podcast, we meet Dr. Michael Brown and discuss his book, Breaking the Stronghold of Food how we can conquer food addictions, and discover a new way of living. Until then, have a happy and healthy day. <music>